Okay, let me go live on YouTube now, and then we will get started. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Phenomenal. How are you? Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, believe it or not, the endocannabinoid system, uh, understanding CBD. Hi, and uh, it looks like you? we're live now on YouTube. Um, so essentially, tonight, we are speaking about the endocannabinoid system, which is basically been made very, very popular these days because it seems like CBD is everywhere. And believe it or not, tonight we're going to be talking about the system from the perspective that is not related to CBD. And one of my goals for tonight is for you to understand that the whole CBD phenomenon is over accentuated with um, this uh, emphasis on CBD and how CBD does everything and you need cannabis, essentially a form of cannabis in order to be able to activate this system. Um, my goals for tonight are basically to, uh, for you to understand what this system is because it's a natural part of our bodies, what, the, what it does um, and how to activate it without using cannabis. And I think you'll understand why I have such a broad appreci appreciation for a broad diversity of herbs, spices, vegetables, et cetera, because that's been a recurring theme in all of the classes that we've had, uh, whether it was talking about fiber and how you need to get a diverse set of plants uh, from different plant families for you to be able to get the, the whole spectrum of different plant, different plant fibers. Uh, whether it is talking about polyphenols and the different types of chemical compounds that are beneficial to your health beyond the fact that they can also affect the endocannabinoid system, which you're going to learn about tonight. So let me share my screen and we will get started. Okay, and I'd like to welcome uh, Lewis, a guest, uh, Pat, Sheila, Trisha, Vicki. Uh, hey, everybody. All right, let me, I'm um, having trouble here with the share screen, so give me a moment. Here it is. Okay, so people on Instagram, you're not going to be able to see the screen, uh, but I'll be talking about it in depth. Uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question, please do just type it into the chat box on Zoom um, and or you can type it in on Instagram as well. So tonight, I basically labeled the class tonight, um, the endocannabinoid system, and I put in parentheses without cannabis. And the reason is, is because my focus tonight is for you to understand it without even resorting to thinking about it from, from the perspective of cannabis. And you'll understand why it was named that way um, initially and how essentially it's, it's a result of the history of how it was founded that it's focused commonly on cannabis. And let's go through tonight's goals. So tonight, I really would like for you to understand um, the basic system as it naturally exists in the body. So you have an, a basic understanding of that. I want you to understand why it's important for your overall health, because it's sort of an evolving science. Uh, one of the principles, again, that I, we've spoken about week after week is that what's good for one system is often good for another system. And that kind of general rule when it comes to your basic health, you're going to see in tonight's class that the things that are beneficial for the endocannabinoid system, those things that activate it and modulate it and, and what's what they call regulating the tone of the system, keeping it, keeping it functioning at, a, which means keeping it functioning at sort of a, a good level, those things are going to be good for your gut. They're going to be good for your heart. They're going to be good for your brain. And this is one of the, the biggest rules, I guess you could say, that, that I've been talking about uh, you know, for the 16 or 17 weeks that we've been uh, meeting every Wednesday night. So I want you to understand why you don't need cannabis at all. You don't need CBD at all to activate this system. Uh, I want you to have a further appreciation, as I mentioned, of why continuing to pursue wider and wider, a wider and wider diversity of plants into your diet. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about aromatherapy tonight um, as an activating me mechanism, 
but it's also sort of utilizing plants, learning how to utilize these plants in such a way that they are beneficial for your health. Because we have been blessed with uh, modern delivery distribution system where you can go to Whole Foods and you can buy essential oils and you can buy spices and you can buy a whole wide variety of vegetables. Even, you know, you can get all these things at Walmart as well. So we have, we are blessed in many ways to be able to have access at our fingertips, everything, most, most everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, and I think it sort of is one of those things that we should be pursuing, uh, learning how to start trying and introducing some of these things into, into our lifestyle. So for this further appreciation of, of a diversity of plants and then practical, not so practical guidance uh, to activating the system without cannabis. I think you'll understand why I said it that way in just a moment. So let's move into, well, what is the endocannabinoid system? So it's basically a signaling network that has some regulation over a whole host of, of things. It has some regulation. Again, it's not the sole regulating factor of the metabolic you know, processes or the immune system or the neurological system, but it has modulating effects, can affect the activation, the overactivation of these, these systems. It also has a direct effect on general inflammation. And as we know, as we've spoken about on other classes, having a strategy to battle inflammation is really a key factor in battling chronic, many chronic diseases. So if we have some kind of, um, some kind of strategy for that, then we can tackle a lot of these a lot of these diseases. So uh, that's essentially what it has a control over. Now it's basically characterized in sort of two particular systems. So we have the central nervous system and we have the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is your, your spinal cord and your brain. And the periphery is we're talking about the nerves outside your, your, uh, your central nervous system. So when it comes to the main function of this, when it comes to the central nervous system, it can affect all of these things. It can affect your cognition, your ability to think, uh, just the general homeostasis. So what's the, what's the balance of the, of the nervous system? We've spoken a great deal about the balancing your nervous system in the past. And this is the endocannabinoid system can be very critical actually in it sort of affecting the balance of your nervous system. It can affect your emotional response, uh, it affects your motivation as well. And that's sort of what it's doing in the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, um, it's affecting your autonomic nervous system. We've sort of spoken about that sort of your like involuntary nervous system, um, but it's, we, we've also spoken a lot about how everyone needs 15 minutes a day to basically balance out, to relax and to balance out your nervous system. Well, this is another way when you're activating the endocannabinoid system, this is another way of sort of working to balance the system out. Um, the nervous system does influence the, the immune system and also I believe it or not has some, some effect on microcirculation. So it's naturally produced by your body. You know, a lot of, when I first, I don't think in medical school, we had very little information. We never, there, I don't recall, maybe very briefly in, I believe it was uh, one of our pharmacology classes in medical school, a brief lecture about, about endocannab the endocannabinoid system. Uh, of course, that was, that was many years ago. Of course, there's a lot of the science is relatively recent. Uh, but one of the first things that you should understand is that this, the endocannabinoids, things that activate this system, you know, everyone knows marijuana and uh, CBD are, are activating the system, but it's naturally produced in your body. And there are basically two, two chemicals that are related to compounds that are related to two receptors. And one's called anandamide, which is, an, ananda is Sanskrit for bliss. Um, and that binds to the CB1 receptor. And then there's another one called 2AG, which we'll call it, and that binds to the CB2 receptor. 
Um, and most of this research was actually done in Israel. Uh, the first CB1 anandamide was isolated first by a professor Mechulam uh, at Hebrew University. And this anandamide, which again is produced naturally in your cell membranes, um, it's also similar to THC that you would get from marijuana, but it's, this is a natural, naturally produced and it activates this CB1 receptor. Um, it's, it doesn't last very long. When you basically, when the cell membrane activates this in, and releases it, it, it acts for very short periods of time. What Professor Mehulam noticed was, was that uh, he discovered why THC, which is the psychoactive component of marijuana, he recognized that it's binding to this CB1 receptor, but he isolated anandamide, which is the natural, uh, the natural compound released by the body, uh, which basically naturally plays a role in feeding behavior, memory, motivation, pleasure. Um, it also activates receptors that affect pain sensation, and uh, it's present for a very short period of time when it's broken down by a specific enzyme. And I mention that here because some of the things that we're going to be talking about later on when it comes to natural mechanisms to, to, to benefit you and to activate this system, some of these work by basically preventing um, this enzyme from breaking down the the anandamide, the natural anandamide. So there are certain uh, natural compounds that will basically inhibit this so that the natural levels of anandamide rise and then you get beneficial effects for your overall uh, activation of the endocannabinoid system. So I hope that's clear. So uh, we'll get into a little bit more about that as we go on, go through the class, but the most important part of, of understanding this is that there are two receptors. The first receptor, as I said, was discovered uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem um, and is naturally present, but is also the receptor that's activated by THC, the psychoactive component of, of marijuana. Now, now we come to uh, CB2. CB2 is also isolated in Israel by a doctor by the name of Shimon Ben Shabbat at Ben Gurion University. And I actually had the opportunity to visit, not him, but Ben Gurion University probably around 10 years ago. And um, it's a remarkable place. It's, it's out in the, the Negev, in the desert, the middle of the desert in, uh, in Beersheba, which you may remember from, from your Bible classes, sort of one of the places where uh, Abraham lived. And out, of, out in the middle of this desert is this town called Beersheba that it, the university is really remarkable. Uh, it, it, it has all modern buildings and it's an incredibly diverse student body. They have, uh, because they're in the middle of the desert, there are a lot of uh, Bedouin uh, university students. And I remember I sat in on a class where it was like, recent immigrants from Morocco and Argentina, France, Ethiopia. So it was a pretty remarkable place, all studying at this really modern university. And they were able to connect me with uh, several doctors of my specialty. And I had dinner with them, a really remarkable place. Uh, but, and most of the, of the research surrounding the uh, endocannabinoid system is coming out of Israel. One, because both uh, CB1 and CB2 were both isolated, uh, were both understood, I should say, and, and discovered in, in Israel. But in addition, there's very little stigma when it comes to, to hemp and marijuana. In the United States, you know, there's the sort of, there's a, as you know, as you all know, there's sort of a stigma when it comes to discussing hemp even. Uh, even though it was uh, very critical of the beginning of our country, the obviously, as, as time went on, it took on a stigma. Um, and as a result, even though that stigma was for, for the drug marijuana, it also has stymied research when it comes to uh, investigating just the entire endocannabinoid system, which is breaking down just a little bit uh, now. So the second 
CB2, also uh, isolated in Israel at Ben Gurion University, and it's anti-inflammatory and immune modulating. And we'll be spending most of the time tonight speaking about how to activate the endocrine, the non-CB1 uh, receptor. We're not talking really about the the um, directly talking about the CB1 receptor, but more talking about the entire endocannabinoid system. Uh, just let me look here. Uh, Sheila is calling in from Bend, Oregon. Uh, Dan is asking, does any of this contribute to what is referred to as a natural high? That's a, that's Dan asking. That's, um, a, well, sometimes a natural high is just a, an endorphin release. But I can tell you that sometimes when you act, when you really potently activate the, the um, endocannabinoid system, you can get like an overall body well feeling of wellness that that makes that is somewhat like a natural high. But usually the natural high is related specifically to endorphins, and those are are different from um, from what we're talking about tonight. And so again, anyone who has any questions, please do put them right into the chat box. Okay, so in summary, before we move on, uh, we have two receptors, CB1, CB2, um, and a CB1 is sort of the marijuana one, the THC, the one that gets you high, uh, but it's important to remember that it's a natural, there's a chemical called anandamide that's naturally produced. Uh, these are, both of these things are naturally produced in the body. It just so happens that THC uh, marijuana activates that receptor. The receptor is there for its own purposes. So what basically is a cannabinoid, which is a cannabinoid is basically a compound that, that can affect the, the cannabinoid receptors, that can affect this system. And they can be endogenous, which is what we just spoke about, endogenous meaning within the body. So anandamide, that, that chemical is endogenous, it's produced by the body. But there's also th things called phytocannabinoids, phyto meaning plant and cannabinoids, meaning things that activate the cannabinoid system. And we'll be spending a lot of time for the rest of the class, for the most part, talking about phytocannabinoids beyond cannabis. Um, and they, it could have very well been the fact that when the professor in Israel discovered uh, this chemical and then found out that THC from cannabis activated it, if he had discovered another chemical, maybe one of these terpenes, it might've been called the endoterpenoid system. I mean, that, so that's basically what, uh, the reason it got that name was because of the way the research evolved. The research evolved such that THC was the first compound that, that was discovered to activate it, which is related to cannabis. Um, so in addition to the CB1 and CB2 receptors, there are also secondary receptors, which are called PPARs. And we're going to get into what those are, um, but now we have three types of essentially ways of activating the system that we've come up with. We've come up with the endogenous, as well as the uh, THC of the CB1, and then we have uh, the CB2, and now we have another receptor called PPAR. So now we have three receptors, essentially, that um, could be activated to act to activate the cannabinoid system. So let's talk now about uh, what I've labeled here, the CBD surprise. It seems like CBD is in everything. And many of you have, may have tried CBD, um, but it's interesting, you know, we just spoke about CB1 and CB2. So you might be thinking, well, it must activate one of these receptors and the fact is, is that CBD actually doesn't really affect cannabinoid receptors. It works through a different mechanism. And it works through these PPARs that we spoke about, which are called peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, which I actually, um, I actually did research in medical school on, uh, in PPARs many, many years ago. And also through its interaction through something called NF-kappa B or nuclear factor B. And the NF-kappa B is basically the inflammatory on-off switch in your cells. That's one way of looking in, into it. It's essentially turned on when you have things like infections or you have an emotional, an excessive emotional response, like a fight or flight, metabolic stress when you, you know, you've essentially are eating poorly and you know, your blood sugar is high, this can create a, a metabolic stress. 
and that can turn on the inflammation in your cells. And it can be overactive. It can be overactive due to poor lifestyle. And it can essentially, when this happens, when you get overactivation of, of NF kappa B, this is going to lead to things like low energy, um, lack of mental clarity, poor sleep, emotional ability, all of these things, believe it or not, can be a direct response to having too much inflammation going on in your body. Which means, of course, since we're thinking logically here, that if we can somehow affect this NF kappa B, um, then you're going to be able to reduce inflammation um, and, and basically we're leading back here to the fact that it's going to interact with the cannabinoid system. And as we've already learned, that cannabinoid system is also, um, we're getting more specific in terms of how it's affecting inflammation. But as you can see, this sort of works its way back. Um, when you are able to affect these two things, PPARs, as we, as we spoke about just a second ago, and NF-kappa-B, these two things, you can just think about it as if we can affect these things, we can activate the, the cannabinoid system, which is going to help with, um, with general inflammation. So let's speak a little bit more um, about basically the plant products that can affect, the, they can interact with the cannabinoid system directly by inhibiting NF-kappa B. And these basically are broken down into in generally into, into two, two or three categories. One is polyphenols, which many of you are, we've spoken about probably during every class, which are these plant chemicals found in fruits and vegetables. Then there's something called terpenes. We've also spoken about that in our mushroom lecture where we spoke about um, reishi mushrooms and how the Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine has bas basically um, shown that you can, they used to make alcohol tinctures of certain mushrooms like reishi mushrooms. So they would soak the reishi mushroom in alcohol and that would actually dissolve the, the terpenes and they would get into the alcohol and they would use it as a medicinal tincture that is an alcohol tincture because terpenes are basically, they're essentially the oils of, of plants. They're the volatile, you know, evaporative oils of plants. And we'll get into a lot more detail of this as, as we go on. But these terpenes also affect the, the endocannabinoid system. They, they directly affect it. Um, and other dietary cannabinoids uh, that can inhibit this, this inflammation switch, which is related to the endocannabinoid system. So I've broken it down into four categories food, herbal medicine, uh, essential oils, and supplements. And all of these things are going to inhibit NF-kappa B and thereby um, affect the endocannabinoid system. Now you could have something that inhibits NF-kappa B. It isn't directly related to the endocannabinoid system, but the things I'm listing here have been shown to do such a, such a thing. And when I mention essential oils, which we can start off with right here, uh, and we'll repeat We'll repeat them again. Uh, I think this is without an E. Delete that. Um, you'll start to realize that uh, there's so many ways of activating this. And we'll end tonight talking about something called the entourage effect, which is how when you combine these things that you're going to get a, a great effect. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So when it comes to food, uh, these are the things that, that inhibit NF-kappa B. Allicin, which is found in onions and garlic. Curcumin, which is turmeric. Uh, EGCG, which is basically green tea, like I have here. Quercetin. Uh, quercetin is found in a bunch of, it's found in all vegetables. Uh, it's found commonly in buckwheat. Uh, it also has immune modulating effects. Uh, it helps zinc get into the cell. So that's why we've, we've heard a lot about, you may have heard a lot about quercetin in, in the news because zinc is antiviral and because of the COVID epidemic, there were certain uh, doctors like Dr. Weil who recommended people take uh, quercetin. Um, it's also an amazing 
amazing for inhibiting uh, histamine. So people have like allergic responses. They can take uh, reasonably large doses of quercetin. And interestingly, um, when you go to Japan and you get soba noodles, it's always been known that the water that they that is left over in, in your soup from the soba uh, or that they boil the soba in is rich in something called rutin and, and it also has quercetin. And it's been known for ages, probably thousands of years in Japan that, and you go to a very traditional soba noodle restaurant in Japan, after the dinner, they will actually bring you a bowl of the water that they boiled the soba noodles in. And it's, it's very, very rich in something called uh, rutin, which stabilizes um, capillaries um, and also quercetin. So, you know, they didn't know a thousand years that this was sort of benefit, had remarkably beneficial effects. Uh, I don't know, that off track, but I just thought it was an interesting story. So quercetin, resveratrol, of course, which is in red wine. Uh, rosemary has a couple compounds in it that actually activate the endocannabinoid system uh, beyond carnosol. So fluorophane, which is found in car uh, cruciferous vegetables like kale, collards, broccoli, uh, that sort of thing, mustard greens, and ginger also, which would also be listed in the herbal medicine. Uh, you could call it herbal medicine as well. Now, these are probably not, maybe they're not even a surprise because they, these types of uh, things like onions, garlic, turmeric, green tea, uh, quercetin, resveratrol, all these things have popped up in many different lectures. Um, and uh, lectin free dad is saying zinc and vitamin C great for keeping lots of bad stuff away, definitely. And if you have a little bit of quercetin, it's good to help get the zinc into, into the cell. Um, and we've spoken about all these things and and I, I highlight some of those extra things about quercetin just to show that these have multiple beneficial effects, not just what we're talking about tonight. Now, when it comes to herbal medicine, ginkgo, ginkgolides, which is in like uh, uh, ginkgo biloba, silymarin, which is milk thistle, berberine, which is from uh, barberries, and allicin again, which it can also be considered a, an herbal medicine, uh, also activate also inhibit NF-kappa B and interact with the, with the system. Now let's talk about essential oils. Well, this, the copaiba tree has a essential oil called beta cari filene, and this actually directly um, interacts with the CB2 receptor. So this, there's a lot of interest in this actually, and you can get it, uh, you can actually get it as an essential oil um, it does have very, like I said, direct effect to, to the endocannabinoid system. Limonene, which is uh, no surprise uh, in terms of where it comes from, it's from citrus. Uh, lemon, it's essential, essential oil of, of lemon, but limonene, uh, alpha pinene, like pine, sage, and eucalyptus. And you know, for me, as an example, I sometimes take a bath with eucalyptus scented uh, Epsom salts. And I don't know if you've ever been in a spa. I was in a spa like last year and someone in the sauna was passing around uh, essential and a eucalyptus oil. And there was something about like breathing in that eucalyptus oil. And I don't think I knew that eucalyptus oil affected the endocannabinoid system, but it was almost instinctive that when you smelled this, you, you know, you, you relaxed, you felt relaxed. Uh, it, was, it was really remarkable. And we know that this not only inhibits some of the inflammation associated with, with what we're talking about, but it directly affects, directly activates the endocannabinoid system. And um, myrosine, which is found in lavender and frankincense. All of these essential oils, um, in fact, can also be found in cannabis. Um, in fact, a lot of the growers of cannabis are um, I don't know all the details about how they're breeding these, these things, but I know that they are Try, they're trying to breed into the cannabis higher levels or levels of these um, myrosine and beta carophyllene and limonene. They, they actually have, have, I don't exactly know how they do it, but they breed them to have this as well. But what we're learning now is that you can get these without cannabis because the copaiba tree 
can get the oil, you can get, you can buy essential oils and a diffuser and get some of these benefits into your life through aromatherapy. And, you know, for a long time, I mean, look, if you were to ask me when I left medical school, if aromatherapy had any impact on your health, I probably would look at you like you were crazy. You know, I didn't learn about uh, that having any effect. And the truth is, is that by itself, the effects are minimal. You actually have to combine all of these things together in order to get a significant effect. But that's fun to do. And, you know, if you take a bath, try try to buy some some oil, essential oils and see how that affects the experience of, of your bath and your relaxation. Uh, supplements can also affect this. So vitamin A, C, and E, um, N-acetyl, N-acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, uh, which you can get from uh, organ meats, uh, it's found in, but you can take as a supplement, zinc, and fatty acids like fish oils can also affect this system. And uh, I'm going to say it one more time, even though we didn't get to it, but I, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to talk about it now. But again, I spoke about this entourage effect, which is basically how you get a synergistic effect, which basically means one plus one equals four, which means that you, if you combine an essential oil like lavender, you know, you put lavender in your bath or you do a lavender um, diffuser, uh, you know, for aromatherapy and, you know, you're eating a lot of great stuff and, you know, maybe you're taking an herbal medicine or some supplements that also activate this. It's the sort of the combination of these things that's going to really potently activate the endocannabinoid system. But Logically, as we've spoken about so many times, when we, when we spend time incorporating a wide variety of different plants, herbs, etc., you're basically going to get this effect. In other words, you're going to improve your health, not just through the endocannabinoid system, but because of it, these things that I'm talking about have so many different effects. And it just so happens that right now it's sort of a trendy thing because there's a lot of money behind it. And we're hearing a lot about the endocannabinoid system. A lot of people are making money, you know, and so it's, it's a little bit overblown in, in a sense, because my goal, again, as we, as I've spoken about tonight is for to convince you that if you're partaking of the things that I'm talking about, which are non-cannabis related, you're going to activate the endocannabinoid system, but you're also going to have overall beneficial effect beyond that. So we spoke about these uh, PPARs. Uh, they are related to fatty acid metabolism. There's uh, three of them, basically. They help with changing your body's fuel from sugar to fat, which we've spoken about in another lecture. They're related to insulin sensitivity and lipid storage, which is what um, partially what I was doing research on in, in uh, medical school. And what is it activated by? Well, certain hormones, but also terpenes. Those things that we spoke about that also inhibit NF-kappa B. See how these things are sort of overlapping? So these terpenes, and you're gonna hear more about ter terpenes as the years go by, but remember they are mostly derived from these volatile oils, these evaporative volatile oils of, of plants that we've spoken about already. Just doing a time check here, wow. Time flies. Uh, again, if anyone has any questions, let me know. So, uh, so we've talked about, just in summary, we've talked about polyphenol. Well, we, we haven't actually spoken too much about polyphenols. We'll speak about them in just, just a moment. Uh, so we've got these dietary cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, plants, compounds that interact directly with the endocannabinoid system. And remarkably, polyphenols do that as well. And again, you're not coffee, tea, uh, pigmented fruits, you know, quercetin again, have a direct impact. Uh, lignans, which are found in flax, uh, most commonly lots of other vegetables, but also like things like sesame and kale also have lignans. These are all polyphenols. Now, again, you're not going to get activation. You're going to get activation, but you're not going to get significant activation unless you're combining the polyphenols that you're eating, which you should be eating, of course, all, all the time. Uh, you wanna get all those pigmented fruits and vegetables into your diet. If you combine that with say lavender or citrus oil, that's going to help with anxiety and depression. And if you're 
eating a well-balanced, you know, meals, as well as maybe taking a supplement or two that we spoke about, you're going to get this entourage effect, this one plus one equals four, which is then going to result in an active sort of activation of the endocannabinoid system. Uh, beta carophyllene which we spoke about from the uh, copaiba tree, but also is uh, this terpene is um, also found in oregano. So oregano oil, uh, cinnamon, black pepper also has it. And so we have to keep in mind that all of these things, which uh, many of them, uh, again, we haven't spoken in, 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 this is like I said, our 16th or 17th week, we've only spoken briefly about terpenes, but um, now we're speaking more about them because of this particular thing. We've spoken about the, uh, the entourage effect and this synergistic effect, this one plus one equals four effect um, and how these terpenes can interact directly with your receptors. And the way it works is because there are these oils, they actually sort of dissolve into the cell membranes and they allow the, they affect the permeability of the membrane, which means it makes it almost more liquid so that the other things that we're talking about, like the polyphenols and, you know, all the things that we spoke about up here with this, with additionally with central, essential uh, oils and herbal medicine, the, the terpenes are going to allow them to penetrate through the cell. And that's partly why it makes it more beneficial, more synergistic as we've, as we've spoken about. And I wanted to end tonight with something that is being discussed and written about, and that's what's called the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And first of all, it's good to know that there, that enzyme that we spoke about earlier that breaks down anandamide, there are genetic polymorphisms where some people have too much, they have an overactive enzyme where they break down the natural anandamide, that natural bliss chemical, they break it down uh, too fast, which means that it can lead to low levels of, the, of activation of the endocannabinoid system. And you can actually test your gene for that. I do essentially a, a, a nutrigenomics panel on a lot of my patients. And that's one of the things we test for. And in that case, for those people, it's important to, uh, they could certainly try CBD if they want, but as you can all tell, my goal here is to convince you that for optimal health, yes, you should pay attention to the endocannabinoid system, but you should do so through polyphenols and terpenes and those sorts of things without having to necessarily resort to to CBD. You can certainly try CBD. There's no, nothing wrong with that, but it's an, an emphasis on just one, one particular pathway. And with this, you get multiple pathways. We're finding that this endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, which is still not, it's sort of more of a, of a not a well-defined type of thing. We're seeing that um, this sort of some, first of all, these genetic polymorphisms are found and the alterations are found, uh, the genetic polymorphisms, that is, in things like anxiety and bipolar disorder, maybe associated with, with um, some variants of potentially schizophrenia. But the fact is, is that uh, sometimes these genetic polymorphisms are affecting the endocannabinoid tone. And if the person is essentially not taking care of themselves and has activation of that NF-kappa B through poor diet, that's going to increase general inflammation. And the way to get things back is to think about things from one way, from through the lens of the endocannabinoid system and activating it, like we've spoken about. Uh, some people are postulating that it may contribute to things like migraine and fibromyalgia, MS, and a whole host of, of other things. So these are the things I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, we are at 840, which is what I was hoping to, to do. And I wanted to review very, very briefly what we spoke about and go through the goals that, that we had at the very beginning. So my, one of my first goal tonight was for you to understand that this is a basic system of the body. And I, and I think everyone now understands that this is a natural part of, of our body. I secondly wanted to talk about why it's important for your overall health 
specifically about how we've learned tonight that it's important for affecting pathways of inflammation that also affect your immune system as well. And uh, this inflammation, of course, is can, this overactivation of the immune system as well is associated with a lot of autoimmune diseases as well. So there are a lot of people who are looking into modulating and affecting the endocannabinoid system as a way of regulating some of the overactivation of the immune system in, in autoimmune disease. Um, so you understand now specifically why you don't need cannabis to activate this system. In fact, I think because of the multiple benefits of all those plant-based compounds that we spoke about, I think you're better off if, if you've decided you want to say experiment with the endocannabinoid system, which is usually someone saying, oh, you know, I think I'm gonna try CBD, which is fine. Um, realize that you can have that effect by including this diverse set of polyphenols and terpenes and trying aromatherapy and all these different vegetables and such. Uh, my fourth goal was for you to have a further appreciation of why we need to continue if we're looking for health optimization to pursue wider and wider, diver, a wider and wider diversity of plants and thinking about the plant kingdom as a medicinal kingdom. In fact, you know, one of the things I didn't mention was that they did this study where they tested um, chi traditional Chinese medicine and something like 50% of the medicines which are basically a whole mess of mushrooms and herbs and such, um, were essentially activating um, the PPAR system or inhibiting NF kappa B. So they they had they were on you know this ancient type of practice was sort of already familiar, not with the definition or the outline of what it looks like today, but they sort of had some some knowledge. And then we spoke a little bit about how to activate the system with, without cannabis, with particular focus on this entourage effect. You can't just try, well, you can just try a diffuser and some, some essential oils, but you're better off working with all of these things together to get a one plus one equals four effect. So that is the endocannabinoid system without cannabis uh, next week. Thank you all for, uh, for your attendance and sticking around. Um, I wanted to talk about um, next week. So next week, we're going to be talking about menopause um, and also something called andropause. We'll be mostly speaking about menopause, but andropause is essentially what happens to men when they get older and their testosterone drops. And it's important for men to know that there's such a thing and to realize that there are certain things that they can do about it. Um, but most of the time, probably the majority of the class will be talking about menopause, what it is, um, how to modify it, uh, how to restore metabolism uh, by understanding the system. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's a very interesting thing. Uh, we're all living a lot longer and essentially the body itself is, when you sort of start looking at how the body works, and you see sort of this hormonal decline as you get older, you know, it makes you almost think that, you know, the body was like not meant to, to, to live that long. But the truth is, is that when you have a clear understanding of why it's happening and what is actually happening, that opinion that, you know, you're just sort of in this never ending decline, that opinion can be, can be reversed and you can sort of start to see why through all the things that we're talking about, we can really get to a point where aging and hormonal changes can be all modified, understood without having to resort to, you know, overt things like hormonal manipulation and such just through, uh, through lifestyle and, and understanding what's going on during that process sort of helps you helps you with that. So I think it's a very interesting topic for most people. And I look forward to uh, seeing you next week, always at uh, eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And um, what can I say? Thank you all for, for attending tonight. Um, and just looking at the comments. Thank you, Pat.
wish all of you a uh, good night, good health, and I'll see you next, next, um, next Wednesday. Have a great night. Bye-bye.